Hey everybody, we are uh, Bad Content. This is Psych Papers. Uh, this is a podcast where we review different psychological studies each episode. Uh, some very famous unethical ones to some more kind of just cool interesting ones that you probably haven't heard of before. So this is my co-host Joseph. My name is Chris. What's good? I am defending my dissertation in two weeks now. The date has been set, so I'm very excited for that. Um. So today's episode and I'm, is and I'm Joseph on... and I and I'm his friend. And Joseph I, I will... <laughs> is my friend. I'm his friend. <laughs> I think that's all. I think that's what you need to know about me. Yeah, yeah. All right. So today's episode: uh, How do we develop fears and phobias? Uh, are oh, they innate? Right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ready. Do we I'm develop ready. them in childhood? I know. Yeah, I, yeah, the gears like, are going. I, I can see. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't uh, like this already. Uh. <laughs> all right, go ahead. So, our fears and phobias are they innate? Are we born with them? Do we develop them in childhood? Or do our parents like transmit fears to us? There was research uh, conducted by John B. Watson and his grad student, Rosalie Rayner, at John Hopkins University. Uh, these people were fascinated with this question. And this experiment was published in 1920, which means you know it was pretty uh, messed up. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> any any psychology study that is still being talked about today that is that was published like before like 1980 was probably a little messed up <laughs> first just, just that going was before these, we had ethics yeah yeah just as we're going through these i'm already not feeling good about this <laughs> so this is the topic <laughs> in the time period just a combination of those two oh, yeah man. yeah 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 their kind of running hypothesis these two researchers was that um, they, they said, after observing children in the field, whatever that means, uh, Watson hypothesized that children's fear to loud noises was an innate, unconditioned response. So that was just, so children, a child being scared of like a loud bang, that was just kind of something you didn't need to teach, and that was just innate in us. Watson wanted to test whether he could use classical conditioning which is Pavlov's dog, you know, uh, kind of ringing a bell, seeing if the dog salivates, you know, ring a bell, kind of pair it with food. So he wanted to see if he could use classical conditioning to condition a child to fear a stimulus that a child would not normally be fearful of. Oh, no. So in this case, it was a furry children, object. Children, children were involved too. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, um, again, was before kind of... Ethics boards became like a norm in a lot of research institutes. Uh, children are considered like a vulnerable population, similar to, I think it's like prisoners, elderly, disabled veterans, uh, and pregnant women. I think I think those are all of the kind of sensitive populations where if you want to study them, you have to go go through like extra hoops to make sure that uh, they're they're receiving informed consent. So, who was the child that is being tested on? His name was Albert, also known as Little Albert. Oh, uh, no. Little Albert was an <laughs> infant uh, who spent most of his infancy living in a hospital environment because his mother was a wet nurse in the Harriet Lane home for invalid children. Albert lived a normal life. He was healthy and one of the best developed youngsters ever brought to the hospital. He was 21 pounds at nine months of age. He was calm and unemotional. And his emotional stability was one of the main reasons for using him as a subject in this test. Oh. In quote, the researchers felt they could do relatively little harm by carrying out the following experiment. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so before I even get into the, the methods of the study, uh, the researchers did put a portion in the original article about the ethics of the study. And how they oh, okay. experienced, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, how they experienced, <laughs> quote, considerable hesitation, uh, considerable hesitation to what it would be like to condition a fear response in a child in response to an innocuous stimulus. And they did feel a degree of responsibility for this child. Okay. However, oh, they eventually no. decided to make the <laughs> attempt. <laughs> they they kind of said, screw it. 
Uh, and they eventually decided to make the attempt, comforting themselves on. with the reflection that children develop fear anyways. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, so, hold on, hold on. This is what I'm hearing right now. These two people are like, hmm, should we do this? This is kind of messed up, isn't it? Yeah, this is kind of messed up. But you know. <laughs> this you know, children get... go through a lot of fucked up shit in their hey, life in hey, general. I, I, so hey, I've what's, been a, little, what's fuck... a little more? I've been through some fucked up shit. I'm okay. So like, <laughs> what's a little... Yeah, he's, he's one year old. He's not gonna remember any of this. Oh yeah, no! So that was their. Uh, that's how they slept at night. Um, <laughs> all right. So the setup. So they started the study when little Albert was eleven months old, and so they brought Albert into the lab, and they would present Albert with the following things successively. Uh, so they showed him a white rat, a rabbit, a dog, a monkey. They even showed Albert burning newspaper, and Albert was wasn't scared of any of these. These are actual things initially. or just pictures. These are actual things. They actually had a monkey in the lab. They brought a monkey and in for the study. It. <laughs> yep, it's a monkey on a leash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, if, the uh... strings this guy had to pull behind the scenes, like, like <laughs> I can imagine just the, the dean, like, How do, do I you get a really... monkey? <laughs> do, do you really need a monkey? Yes, I do need a monkey for this research. Yeah. <laughs> Like, hey, uh, the, the the monkey's pretty violent. Are you sure you want it around a baby? It's fine. I'm a scientist. It's going to be on a leash. <laughs> so the point was, they showed him all of these things, and Albert wasn't scared of any of these things initially, right? So the conditioning stage one happened when Albert was 11 months old. To start the conditioning, they presented Albert with the white rat, uh, and just as Albert would begin to reach for the rat, right as his hand touched the animal, right behind Albert, there was a large steel rod hanging from a string. Another researcher would get like a like a stick, like a baton, and smack the rod, making like a loud bang. All right, so right as Albert touches the rat, they strike the rod, makes a loud bang. It scares the crap out of Albert. Uh, they, uh, I quote, the infant jumped violently and fell forward, burying his face in the mattress. He did not cry, however. So that obviously <laughs> won't do. We're 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 gonna need we're gonna need more than that, you know. <laughs> <sighs> All right, let's get to it. So falling falling forward, burying your face in the mattress—that's good. Can we get can we get can we get some some crying? Can we get some weeping in here? <laughs> can we can, how can we escalate this? Oh no. Yeah. How, <laughs> <laughs> how do we amp this up? <laughs> how do we escalate this scene? Yeah. Oh, man. All right. So, again, right as Albert tried to touch the rat again, they struck the bar again. All and right. now, little Albie starts to whimper. One week later, the little Albie comes back into the lab. And they present the rat again without any sounds, just the rat. And little Albie fixated on the rat. He was looking at it, but he didn't reach for it at first. And when the rat's nose touched Albert's hand, Albert quickly pulled his hand away. Okay. So clearly one trial, one like, you know, was initial it, day was of this conditioning already had an effect. Yeah. Yeah. But they were like, we're going to need more than that. We need to escalate this. So. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> they showed the rat uh, again. And right as okay. Albert touched it, they struck the bar. As they call it, a joint stimulation. You know, you're you're pairing the touching of the rat with the striking of the bar. That's the joint stimulation. And they did this four times in the same day. Oh. All right, so there goes that uh, consciousness. Where, it probably yeah, went away yeah. after that week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after week, they're like, you know what? It's not even that bad. It's not even that bad. <laughs> you know what? I slept on it. I think he'll be okay. We'll be okay, more importantly. So Yeah. <laughs> How am I going to get these publications, man? <laughs> I got I to I gotta stay tenured, Kofi. <laughs> I got to keep my tenure. Yeah. Oh, hey, man. I got kids of my own, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So they did this four more times until 
Albert starts freaking out and crying, and he's trying to crawl away whenever they show him the rat. Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so that was the second, the second day. Okay. And uh, they had a quote there that they say it's likely that if the bang was louder, like if they had a bigger steel rod or a bigger oh. baton, they could smack uh-huh. it. With. They, they say if it was louder, it would probably have taken less trials. <laughs> so <laughs> these, guys, these people, they were like, yep. is this loud enough? Mm. Is mm. This- <laughs> what's, what's the best way to scare a baby? <laughs> <laughs> and I quote, uh, experiments designed to define the nature of the sounds that will serve best as emotional stimuli are underway. So they were like, ooh, this is another potential line of research we could conduct. What are the scariest sounds for babies? <laughs> Maybe if we just scream at Albert, you know? <laughs> Five days later. Okay, another they gave it another they gave it a work week. They got a work so week. So he got he got another he got uh-huh. five business days, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So little Albert comes back in. That's enough work for us. Let's get, let's get you know let's what? this back. I think one I think one week was more than he needed. Five days <laughs> is probably good, right? Five days later. Now we they wanted to test. Is there a transfer between objects for fear? So we know Albert's fearful of this white rat. Is he fearful of other things that share similar properties? So they showed Albert a rabbit, a dog, and a fur coat, and Albert was scared shitless. So this had demonstrated that Albert had transferred his fear of originally just the furry white rat to other furry animals and objects. So that was if there was a incidental transfer. Okay. Five days later, <sighs> little Abby comes back in. Now let's see if we can just intentionally transfer his fear. So they showed the rat. Oh, wait. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, all right. They showed the rat again. And uh-huh. Albert only reacted slightly negatively. Okay. So I quote, It was thought best to freshen up the reaction with another <laughs> joint stimulation. <laughs> Yo, I've got, a, I've got a board. This has got a board. Man, get, little Albert's kind of pissing me off right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bitch. You're not scared. I, let me show you what I can. Let me show you. Let, let me show you fear. <laughs> I'll show you true fear, Alvi. <laughs> okay. So, so, not impressed. They ran. Yep. So, they freshened a little Albi up with another joint stimulation of the rat. Then they ran the same joint stimulations. This is when they show the object or the animal and then they bang the rod. Uh-huh. They ran the same joint stimulation with the rabbit and dog hitting the steel rod while showing Albert the animals. Which is kind of weird because I feel like they already proved their hypothesis. That they can condition fear and it can transfer to other objects. Yeah, and now yeah, they're just yeah, yeah. kind of messing with this baby, right? <laughs> I know. They're just like, it's like one, of the, I get, one of the assistants like, you know, Professor, I think uh I think we got I got like, no, 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 we gotta we <laughs> no, we got, no, 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 we no, have no, to we, gotta we have to. <laughs> uh all right. So then after they intentionally transferred the fear to these other okay. animals. This is where they ended the emotional manipulations. He comes back in a month later. Oh, okay. And and they and they tested him again. No more is joint stimulations. Mo- they just they just was showed that time. Pe- was that month intentional? Sorry, was that month intentional? Yes. Yep. Okay. It was okay, to okay, see okay. kind of you know how, uh, uh, how long, like how long do these fear responses kind of remain after a okay, period so, of okay. conditioning? Okay. Sorry. So, so a month, month later, Al- Albert was, comes yeah. back in. And the fear reactions remained. Albert was still scared of all of these objects. A white rabbit uh, or a white rat, a rabbit, dog, etc. The f- a fur coat. Usually um, in research, there's like uh, something called like debriefing, which is supposed to like, quote unquote, like extinguish the effects of the study. That's when you kind of like you pull back like the curtain and you tell them being like, Hey, by the way, this was all just fake. You know, don't worry. You didn't actually hurt anybody, you know, and this was all just a, you know, a, a ruse that we played on you. Oh, oh and that's yeah. Suppo- like a, that's like supposed a prank to extinguish. Show. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, and that's supposed to this, like yeah. get you back to normal. They were planning on removing that f- conditioned fear response from Albert, but Albert 
was unfortunately removed from the hospital the day those tests were made. Okay. Which I think is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> he, must, he must have been so mad. He's just like, I wasn't done with my study yet. Yeah. And and Albert was removed from the hospital being like, hey, I'm like taking my son. And they're like, oh, today's the exact day that we were going to fix him. Oh, come on. It's like, really? Really? It's the exact same day? And you were, no, 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 hey, no, no. I'll bet. I'll bet. I'll bet. I'll bet. Just, just you know, give me one more dinner. We're sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So as as an aside, how you would go about extinguishing the conditioned fear response is that you would want to show Albert the rat without the loud bang over and over and over repeated exposures until the fear response becomes like fatigued. So basically reversing it. Whatever. Yep. Whatever. And, that and you did, could yeah. even speed this up by pairing the rat with a positive stimulus. Like every time you show Albert the rat, you give Albert like a piece of candy or something. Mm-hmm. This is also like very common in like exposure therapy, right? Mm-hmm. There's something that you're, you know, you have a phobia of, and you're kind of introducing it in small amounts in a safe environment uh, to kind of fatigue that fear response. Before I go into uh, what what happens to little Albert, what's your what's your general reactions or feelings toward the study? Um, well, it's fucked up. Um, the him the, the the kid being removed obviously was intentional, right? Because they knew. <laughs> I can I can just see like the like the researchers coming down and they're just like <laughs> the, the people that work at the hospital are like oh shit we gotta gotta hide this like <laughs> <laughs> oh shit oh shit <laughs> oh shit oh, shit, oh, shit. we gotta hide this kid. pineapple pineapple <laughs> <laughs> they, have, oh, fuck. they have a code word uh there were there were some conflicting reports in my research on this study on whether or not the mother was even aware that Albert was participating in this study. Oh my God. Yeah. So she was working at that hospital and I'm guessing the hospital just had like some type of daycare and it's, it's, this is where it becomes kind of a a little loose. Uh, But the mother may not have been aware that Albert was participating in the study. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing, if you can ever think the story could get any worse, if, if you just keep piling on the possibility that is. That so they is, like kidnapped this kid. Uh, and yeah, they like, were just like <laughs> they were just like they just like, like pulled like they just arrived at the hospital. They're like, all right, who's a, who's a, who's a good kid around here? We can who's a who's a who's a who's a, who's a good looking baby. <laughs> <laughs> The actual identity of Albert B. is unknown. However, there are two leading theories as to who he is. Okay. And I'll tell you them both, and then I'll tell you which one I think is, I think is the right one. Okay. The first one is that he was a person is named our, Douglas is this Merritt. A, hold, is this, a, is this our segment, Guess the Identity? <laughs> guess, guess the identity guess of the, the, guess the, of the tortured child. <laughs> yeah. He might have been a person named Douglas Merritt. Uh, where Albert B. was a pseudonym. Uh, His mother was a wet nurse at Harriet Lane home, um, and this person died of hydrocephalus at the age of six. And the 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 child, little Albert. Yeah. Oh, my God. All right. And uh, apparently, according, the behaviors exhibited by Albert in the study match someone with hydrocephalus. Um, What is that? So that's one theory. Do we know what that is? That is a good question. Uh, quick Google. Neurological disorder caused by an abnormal buildup of cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles deep within the brain. All right. That doesn't sound good. Sounds sounds severe. Yeah. Sounds severe. Yeah. Hydrocephalus, okay, so... also called water on the brain. All right. <laughs> for, for us for us dum-dums. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's that was the first theory that came out in like this kind of big paper in like 1972 or something. That, but that's how long it took for someone to publish a paper being like, "Hey, whatever happened to little Albert?" <laughs> it's like 50 years later. Yeah. Oh my gosh! All right. The other theory is that he was William Albert Barger, which I think this is the more compelling theory. William Albert Barger. He was known by friends and family as Albert because that was his middle name, and his mother did work at the same hospital. His size and developmental condition closely matched the experiment's documentation of the baby. Okay. 
and he died in 2007 at the age of 87. And his niece stated that he had an aversion toward dogs and animals in general. Okay. It wasn't it wasn't severe, but the family would have to keep dogs in a separate room when he visited. Okay. I think this is the much more likely theory. Yeah. Uh, Cuz they they share the name, the conditions of the baby, <clears throat> the fact that he had this aversion toward furry animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he was a young child, <clears throat> the fear was probably stronger, and then as he developed, it kind of fades and fades and fades. Right, reduced. Yeah. But I mean, the fact that it, you know, they conditioned it for like one month when he was like one year old, one year yeah. old, uh, and it remained for a lifetime is imprinted pretty, on pretty him. Pretty astounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, amazing in a bad so, way. Yeah. So, what does this mean for fears and phobias? Uh, it really doesn't take that many bad interactions with something to develop a fear or an aversion toward it. Bro! <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can have one or two or three bad, bad yeah, interactions yeah. with something. I mean, if you think about like, um, if like a child, if they get like attacked by a dog like once, and it might not even be that like severe, they just got like nipped a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that that could be enough to cause like a fear of dogs uh, for that that person. Mm -hmm. And I think I think a lot of people can think of uh, the common event, which uh, people have like an aversion to certain types of alcohol because of a single bad night where they drink too much peach vodka or something, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and another thing is it is it takes less interactions if the exposures are worse. So like a single okay. car crash can create fears of driving for a person, oh, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. This is the magnitude yeah. of it is because it could have taken mm -hmm. your life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, the positive side, this type of emotion, emotional conditioning also applies to positive reactions. Okay. Uh, for example, like as a child, you might have had a lot of positive experiences with going to sports games with your parents or watching a TV show or listening to a certain type of music. Uh, mm. And that kind of imprints on your brain. And now you have positive feelings whenever this music comes on, um, kind of on the radio or whatever you're listening to. Okay. Works the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it kind of it kind of reminded me of uh, military training uh, where they kind of put soldiers through like very rough conditions uh because mm -hmm. they almost want to th there's this one trainer where they almost like simulate drowning for them uh because they're simulating drowning in kind of a safe environment so that if it actually mm -hmm. does come to that they're much more prepared and they're mm -hmm. and they can think more calmly one other side note uh is that interestingly kids will often use what's called social referencing to their parents or to their you know guardian figures or role models to determine their reaction to something so if a child sees a dog for like the first mm -hmm. time, they'll look to their parents and you can see this behavior. Like they'll actually look at them. Oh. Uh, if the parents kind of push the kids behind themselves to protect them, like if the parent puts their body in between the kid fear. and the dog, yeah. it instills fear because it's teaching, hey, this is something that you should be afraid of. And the kid learns oh. to be scared. All right, this is the part of the podcast where we go over the follow-up research that we conducted. I was interested in how common are different fears and how do they differ between groups of people? So this is the research that we conducted. This was the first question that I asked everybody. Which of the following best represents your fears? Select all that apply. So again, this is not asking about like phobias. This is just about like fears that you have. So going down the list, blood or needles, clowns, confined spaces, darkness, death, dogs, Drowning, flying, germs, ghosts, heights, open or crowded spaces, public speaking, spiders or insects, snakes, thunder and lightning, zombies, and then we had an other where they could specify their fears. So, and on top of this, right after that, we asked people about their gender, their temperament, meaning introverted or extroverted, their political leaning, whether they're liberal or conservative, those are the only two choices I gave them, their age, and their highest education achieved. How did you come up with this list? Did you just wrote down Google like common fears people have? The, the, these are some of the most common fears that people have. Okay. I We uh, paid 1,037 participants to take this survey. Damn. Well, we, 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 
We got we we got a little more, but there were some exclusions. <laughs> we did because they passed, didn't pass the attention check. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> we gotta have to check oh, yeah. the balances in this. <laughs> All right. So, Joseph, do you have any guesses from this list of fears on what the the most common okay. one is? Okay, I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna pick the top three. All right. Starting from number three, I think heights is gonna be there. I want to say drowning, and then for number one. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say germs. I think the pandemic potentially made a lot of people germophobic. And I think that might incre- that that might have impacted the study. Okay, cool. Those are uh, pretty good guesses. Pretty good guesses. So here are the overall rankings. Uh, so this is not by group right now. So the overall fear rankings. <laughs> okay, death sorry. was I did, I the most see, common I one. I didn't see death in there. <laughs> that would have been <laughs> my view. All right. Yep. So death was 46% of the sample selected death as a fear. And mind you, and again, these aren't phobias, like clinical phobias. These are just people indicating like, oh, I'm fearful of this. So death was number one, then heights, and then snakes, and then drowning. Mm. Yeah, and then public close. speaking, spiders or insects, we, confined spaces, public ghosts. Public speaking is up there? Bruh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm very surprised by that. And then confined spaces, ghosts blood or needles, darkness, flying. So like a fear of flying. I, I initially thought I was like, but flying is awesome. You could fly in. And then I was like, oh, airplanes, airplanes. Okay, mm, got it, got it. Mm. Open or crowded spaces, okay, germs, what is, what's zombies. Open, what is, well, hold on, before we get the zombies, open or crowded yeah. spaces. Good that, question. That's, uh, that, what is that? That links to like, that links to like uh, agoraphobia. Uh, so like having like severe like social anxiety, not wanting to go outside, mm. or not wanting to be in like in like really big crowds of people. Okay, I feel that. That's I I, I feel yep. like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Zo- so zombies. After zombies. <laughs> Legitimate fear. <laughs> I know. I know. I love that one. I love that one. Zombies. Sixteen percent. Sixteen percent of people fearful of zombies. <laughs> a thousand people. <laughs> That's too much. That percentage yep. is way too high. This is not even okay. Ghosts? I'll give ghosts. Like that. That's fair. No. <laughs> I, I feel like I mean I can see situations where people like see ghosts, but I've never heard anyone say like, "Yo, the other day, you won't believe it, dude. I saw a zombie." Bro. <laughs> I've never heard anyone tell. I, I, ghosts- I swear. And then I blinked and it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's ghost stories. I saw it though. I've never heard zombie stories before. Yeah. The undead. Yeah. Okay, un- undead maybe. All right, anyway. Thunder and right. lightning. So zombies, thunder and lightning, okay. dogs, and then clowns at the bottom. So these are the breakdowns by gender. The biggest differences in here, you can see like there, there, are, there are some differences, some small, some large. I'm going to point out the large differences. Okay. I have no idea why females ranked drowning as such a bigger fear than men. Men, men, men well, are not gonna, uh, you know, just like I think stereotypically, they're not gonna uh, admit to like being afraid of drowning. Like, fuck, I could beat up some water. What the fuck? <laughs> but, but clowns, clowns, and <laughs> germs. <laughs> I'll, I'll fuck up a germ, bro. <laughs> bro. Bro, fucking put a clown in front of me. Just watch. Just watch what happened. Yeah, I mean, drowning. It, this was like a interesting. So females, forty-four percent of females indicated drowning as a fear. Only twenty-four percent of males indicated drowning as a fear. I, I couldn't come up with a rationale for why this might be the case. The other differences that I'll point out, there is kind of a rationale. There, there. I think I can kind of craft a story to explain those differences. But drowning, I have no idea. The next biggest difference I found was public speaking. Uh, females ranked as public speaking as a bigger fear than men. I think this is how kind of boys are typically socialized to be more like aggressive and assertive. Sure. And these are typically like positive traits for for males, whereas. Uh, you know, being uh, being socialized as a female, the way that conventionally goes is that being more kind of like timid and passive is the is the kind of stereotype. So like, so about thirty percent of men uh, indicated that blood or needles uh, are fearful, whereas only nineteen percent of women indicated blood or needles uh, I, I mean, are fears of theirs. I mean, women see blood in their you know what every month. So, yep, yep, but- and and that, and that's a good point. How I was kind of thinking how okay. Well, women typically are raised to be like caregivers that deal with like children's wounds. I mean, they they give birth and they've menstruated since like a young age. So blood needles, not uh, too unfamiliar for them compared to men. So men were a lot more fearful of germs than women. Interesting. And I think this kind of ties in with that as well. Yeah, I think this is, is I think this is explained by the same story. 
a women are typically the, the the caregivers and they deal with and they deal with like children's wounds and they have to deal with a lot more shit than men do all right next i broke it down by temperament so this is introverted or extroverted so i just gave people the option are you introverted or extroverted that's it i'm not doing no Ambivert? Ambi Come on, man. or whatever. I no. consider myself no. the, you know, I'm a, I'm an ambivert, bro. No, I want my graphs to be simple. Okay. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want complexity. Because yeah. <laughs> he was a very simple creature, so. Yes. Here are the fear <laughs> rankings by temperament. And again, I'll, I'll kind of point out the, uh, the, the biggest differences. The yellow is introverted. The purple is extroverted. Okay. So you can kind of see that. Uh, introverts are kind of more fearful of like death yeah. and heights. That's expected. Uh, but a big difference is public speaking. Yeah, yeah. That kind of makes sense, right? Introverts yeah, yeah, yeah. more fearful of public speaking than extroverts. And then along with that, open or crowded spaces. This also kind of makes sense for introverts to be more fearful of. Yeah, the only categories where extroverts were more fearful of were snakes, uh, a slight amount for blood or needles slight amount for germs and dogs and clowns introverts are also way more fearful of zombies compared to extroverts oh oh i see that what's going on there <laughs> yeah huge huge difference introverts hate zombies and what's extroverts cool? are like zombies it, aren't that bad introverts are y'all okay you you're right zombies aren't real you know you're, you're, <laughs> you'll be fine in this world you know i know you don't like to go outside i know i know you don't want to talk in public that's fine but zombies? Come on. <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 the extroverts are just like, zombies are just like kind of weird introverts. So <laughs> I've dealt with them my whole life. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Society is full of zombies, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Aren't we all zombies? Dude, all right. Now, sorry. Race. Next we oh, have. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah let's go ahead. I, that, next we have political <laughs> allergy. So, I'm so sorry. glad you cut me uh, off. That riff was not going to be good. <laughs> Sometimes you can see good, a glad. bit. For miles away, but you can't stop it. So it requires yep. a friend to to put your, put your you know. Next is political ideology. Oh, I don't. So like I gave this. people the option: Are you liberal or conservative? I'm not doing no moderate, in the middle centrist stuff. Just pick one. Can I? Can from I my guess, graphs. Can I guess? Can I guess? Can I guess? I think all conservatives have no fear of death because, um, you know, because a lot of conservatives are also religious. So, and I think conservatives will be scared of ghosts. Don't ask me why. It's just a feeling I have. I think those would be more scared of ghosts okay. than liberals. Because liberals are like, yeah. I don't believe in anything. I question yeah, reality. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Fear rankings by political ideology. So, yep, you're right. Liberals are so liberals in blue, conservatives what? in red. Liberals were more fearful of death. I want socialized health care, but I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's my impression of a, of a scared liberal. Uh, that's, that's, that's the Bernie scared will, liberal. Bernie yep. will never win the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie's getting older. <laughs> He's getting older. Who's going to take over for him? All right, so, yep, so death was one of the larger differences, liberals being more fearful of death. The next dip, big difference was open or crowded spaces. Liberals were much more fearful of this than conservatives. Interesting. I think this kind of has to do with, like, general social anxiety. Liberals are probably more... Um, Ooh, big generalization coming in three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think... If you looked at the mental health stats of liberals versus conservatives, and I think that's just because liberals are probably more likely to go see a doctor if they're feeling some type of way than conservatives. That's my guess. Yep. All right. The next big difference was zombies. <laughs> liberals. I was going to guess. Like very, liberals. very scared of zombies. <laughs> Come on, liberals. What are you, what are you, doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Next one was dogs. dogs. Conservatives are a lot more scared of dogs than liberals. You know what? Here's a big guess, and this is only because I live here in Texas now. Um, like, especially here in El Paso, like the dog can be seen as more, more maybe still a pet, but maybe more as like a guard animal. Someone to pretend you know, a lot of dogs left in mm. the front or backyard. Yeah. And I think just living in places like Chicago and LA, a lot of a lot of a lot of cute chihuahuas, a lot of cute little terrier type dogs. I love my doggy. Yeah, I had that thought too, but then I was like, I know liberals are like all about like rescues, and those are like very very commonly uh, pit bulls. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Interesting. So I don't know. It could go either way. Interesting. But yeah, but kind of to your point, if conservatives view view are more likely to view dogs as like more utilitarian, and they stay outside and they work a job, 
then yeah. those are probably not little small dogs. So other other notable differences were uh, conservatives were more scared of heights and snakes compared to liberals. Interesting. I'm not sure what the story is hmm. there. Maybe but, for uh, snakes. Maybe for snakes. We'll let... The more conservatives live in open spaces where snakes actually exist. And the liberals probably live in urban cities where they're maybe Ooh, not, not as Oh, Joseph. As nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Liberals are more likely to live in urban environments. Yep. No snakes in urban environments. Yeah, yeah that's I like it. that. All right, we're going with it. We're going with it. That's how we do causal uh, analysis here. <laughs> we just, one of us has a, if the other one feels like it's true, we just agree, and then we move yeah. on. Hey, you know what? <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. All sick, right. Sick, it's sick, going sick, in the paper. Sick, sick. <laughs> it's going to go into the conclusion. Yep. Uh -huh. All right, so now uh, we're going to look at a breakdown of fears by age. So okay. I asked people to indicate which age bracket they're in. So it's like 18 to 24, 25 to 34, and it's like each uh, bracket Ooh, is 10 years. Can I guess? I think when you're older, yeah. you're less scared of death. I think when you're, so the whatever age, you know, range you use for the last one, I think you'll be less scared of death. And I think, uh, I think conversely, I think older people are, are also scared of ghosts. Hmm. And then, Interesting. And then younger people, yeah. the younger you are, the more scared you are of public speaking. If there weren't clear patterns, I didn't include them in the graph because because there were like five age brackets, it made the graph very uh, like compressed. So I only included ones. If you don't see the fear here, that means it was probably equal across as you get older. So generally, very generally, people's fears go down as you get older for most things. Uh, death specifically was a big one that showed a clear pattern. A fear of death goes down as you get older. Yo, 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 what's up? So a fear of ghosts decreases as you get older. A fear of darkness, zombies, dogs, and clowns all kind of <laughs> gradually go down. Is this... Is this <laughs> young people are scared. Yep. <laughs> it's more scared of zombies. Are these all... Are people, did, did all these young people watch The Last of Us are like, fuck, I don't want to live in that world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The what Last if, of Us and The Walking if, Dead and all, all, all the zombie movies. Bias. Yeah, I wonder if there's more recency bias, if anything. It could be. Yeah. It could be, yeah. I say, yeah. Yeah, I wondered. There was, like, something like 10 years ago, there was a whole, like, news segment on, like, murder clowns, clowns that were, like, murdering people. I wonder if we did the survey then, if, if people would be more fearful. Oh, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so death, ghost, darkness, zombies, and dogs, clowns, it all goes down. And if you don't see the fear here, uh, generally, it was kind of like a mixed bag. Uh, but overall, there was kind of a general pattern. People just get less scared of things as they get older. There wasn't anything where you got more fearful of it as you got older. Just because as you get older, you experience more life, you know, and you go through more stuff. And, and, and public speaking suddenly becomes not a big deal as much. I, I've heard this from... And I, I feel this too. I just think when you get older, the higher chance of you giving less of a shit about stuff. You get less hung up about yeah. things than you did when you were get younger. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So I did also ask about fear rankings by education. These weren't that interesting. There, there weren't any like clear patterns. All right, everybody. That was the follow-up research segment for the Little Albert episode where we learned a little bit about fears and groups and kind of how fears differ between different groups of people. So I hope you learned something today and have something to talk about at the dinner table, whether that's your fear of zombies or and or clowns and dogs or zombie dogs or zombie clowns. Wow, that would be scary. Follow up survey combined fears. If you start doing fusion fears. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. You're like a zombie germs, like heights, but falling into a deep water. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's a good example yeah that's the yeah. best one i could come up with all right bye <laughs> see yeah, ya yeah. bye <laughs>